So let's have a look at how we can improve trust uh, within our information infrastructures. And we're going to focus on key distribution centres and see how they could be used to be able to create a much more trusted infrastructure for the management and control of our encryption keys. Remember, these are the core of the security of our network and any breach of that infrastructure can cause major uh, damage. It can be extremely costly to be able to clean up after a, a trust uh, breach, both internally with third parties and also globally. Uh, so this is what we have and that uh, what we must do, and increasingly we have more and more devices which are using encryption keys and more and more we're using encryption to be able to protect the data. So those keys are typically session keys which are happening between uh, devices and can be user logins, uh, device infrastructures, VPN networks and so on. So it becomes extremely difficult to manage this type of infrastructure if we use what's called the PKI or the public key infrastructure. That uses digital certificates and we also have static keys. The problem with that is that uh, a breach of one of the keys can actually cause large scale loss of trust within the infrastructure. So a good approach is to use a trust infrastructure which is highly secure and where we keep our encryption keys and also the rights to these keys. We can then also uh, log the usage of these keys so that we can go back and we can audit any connection made uh, if, we, if we require to do that. But what we have here is to make sure that our actual encryption keys are held in a secure way. So let's look at a simple example. So let's say Alice wants to send some money to Bob. So she might create a safe deposit box and then that will have a new key and she could send it over to, to Bob. Alice has no idea if Bob has actually received the key correctly because some Eve could be listening to uh, the, the postal service and getting uh, Bob's mail. Also, Bob has no idea that the uh, letter that, uh, or the key that Alice sent is actually the, the correct key. So with this, we bring in a level of trust. So let's say that Alice and Bob trust Trent. And then what they do is that they, they create a padlock with a key, and then they register that key with uh, Bob. This is their long-term keys. Alice also has a copy of her key, and Bob has a copy of her key, his key. So what we want to do is to be able to use these keys to be able to pass a new secret key or the new safe deposit box that Trent has created. So initially what happens is that uh, uh, Trent takes a photograph of Alice and then actually gives the date and signs uh, a letter say that uh, he has taken a, a picture photograph of Alice. He then puts the key into a sealed envelope. Let's say it has a lock on it. It could be a little, it could be a box here. He takes Bob's key and then will lock that uh, sealed box with uh, Bob's key. He then puts that sealed box into another box and puts in the key. That will then be locked with Alice's key. Next he sends that to Alice and Alice has a look and takes off the key and she puts the money into the safe deposit box. Next she sends the sealed envelope or the sealed box along to Bob and Bob with his key is able to open up this box, checks the photograph of Alice and also the, the date that was taken and then he has the key and will go and open up the safe deposit box and get his money. So that's roughly how it, how it works. Uh, Trent is our most uh, trusted entity here and will hold both Bob and Alice's keys. At any time, Trent can ask for the keys to be refreshed or replaced. But every single time they want to pass money to each other, we'll create a new key. So probably what happens is that Bob 
and once you've taken the money out, it's not really used uh, any anymore. So let's look at a simple example of a key uh, distribution exchange. With this, we have two long-term encryption keys, KA and KB. So KA is the encryption key that Alice has, and KB is the encryption key that Bob has. They will keep this as their long-term key. We might refresh after a certain amount of time, but generally this will be the long-term key. And we need to make sure that these keys are kept securely on the devices, or with the users, and also with the KDC. So when Bob wants to speak to, uh, when Alice wants to speak to Bob, she sends a request with the identity of herself and the identity of Bob. So Bob's identity will then be matched to his key and also to Alice's key. The KDC then creates a session key. So it's a random key, might be 128-bit or 256-bit key. But next, the KDC will encrypt the session key with a uh, with Alice's key and send that to Alice. Same again, Bob, Bob's key will be used to encrypt the second key and then send that to Bob. They then decrypt with their uh, long-term key and they should both end up with the same session key. So when they're communicating we will take our encryption key, we'll take the message encrypt with the session key to get a cipher, and then on the other end, we will decrypt back to the message. So let's see if we can have a look, an example of this. Okay, so we have a long-term key um, for Bob and Alice. We will then encrypt and encrypt and then decrypt with each of the keys, and hopefully at the end, we'll end up with the same key. So we'll just try a few examples just to make sure it works and we can see here that it gives us the same key at, th at the end. Okay, so here's a little simple Python uh, program for this. Uh, we'll generate a random number up to, to, to the power of 128 convert that into an MD5 hash which is 128 bits. Let's say we just need the 128 bit key. We'll end up with Alice's key. We'll do the same for Bob. We'll end up with Bob's key. And this will be the long term key. We'll then create a session key here. And for the session key, we'll again create our uh, 128 bit key from this random number. And then we'll create the YA and YB using AES encryption and send it over. And then when Alice decrypts, she gets this. And when Bob decrypts, he gets this. And hopefully at the end of it, they'll end up with the same key. So that's what we saw here. There's, the, there's two random numbers. There's the encrypted version uh, of the new session key being created. You can see it's different. And then we'll create our two session keys at the end, which should be the same. We can enhance this by not needing to, just like what we saw when we were creating the safe deposit box, what we can do is that we can send both the YA and the YB values back. So that's equivalent to what we were doing earlier. Uh, Alice will be able to decrypt to find the session key. And then to, to encrypt a message to Bob, does the same thing, but this time we'll send YA and also YB. YB is the value that Bob would have got before, but now what we do is that we use the YB value to be able to decrypt to find the session key. We then decrypt with the session key to find the message. So in this way, we don't actually have to communicate with Bob here. We can handle it all through Alice and then send to Bob. It's Im almost impossible for for uh, Bob for anyone else to interfere with the communications here because only uh, the KDC will know Bob's long-term key. So when he tries to decrypt the, this value here, 
If it's not from the KDC, he won't get the right session key. And then when he tries to decrypt the message from the ciphered message from Alice, that if it's anyone else apart from the KDC, he will not be able to decrypt this value here back to the message. So that's the way that a KDC actually works. And the good thing with it is that we can actually make sure that uh, our long-term keys are kept secure. So one of the um, methods that's actually used to implement this in real life is what's called Kerberos. And Kerberos overcomes some of the problems by having a, a lifetime uh, value that will actually define the amount of time that the keys are actually uh, usable for. So in this case, uh, Alice wants to speak to Bob. So we'll send, as we saw before, the identities of Alice and Bob. Trent has uh, Bob and Alice's long-term key and creates a new key, K. Then uh, two values are sent back uh, where we include the time uh, of, the, of the actual creation of the keys, the lifetime of them, how long they're allowed to last for, this session key, and Bob's identity. We'll also send back to Alice the EB value, which is for uh, it, which is for Bob to actually um, interrogate. We then uh, Alice is able to decrypt uh, this value to find the time of the creation of the key, the lifetime, and the key to be used, and also Bob's identity. She will then send through this value, and Bob will then uh, again find out the time because he can decrypt this with his long-term key. He'll find the time that this, the key was created, the lifetime of it, the key that we're going to use for uh, this, and then also Alice's identity. As he now has the key, he will send through the next timestamp uh, for the encryption so that uh, he, we, we can verify that he has received all the parameters correctly. So now uh, they will both have uh, the key, the same key for the, for the connection. So if we look at this in action, it can be fairly complicated, uh, but there's uh, uh, Bob's uh, ID and there's Alice's ID, fairly simple there. And then we'll define the shared key here. So this is uh, Alice's long-term key. This is Bob's long-term key. So then we're going to create a timestamp, a, a lifetime, a new encrypted key, Bob's ID. So then we'll just get it started. Okay, so here is the current time. And we'll make the lifetime 100 seconds. So it's, uh, this key is only valid for 100 seconds. And it's got to be re renegotiated again. This is the key that uh, Trent has created, and there's Bob identity. <coughs> so the uh, the values that are then sent are these two. So that's one, and then that's two. So the first part is for Alice to be able to uh, take this value and decrypt it to find time, lifetime, the key, and Bob's identity. And then this one is for hard to give to Bob and he can determine the same thing. Once we decrypt it we can see the timestamp and this is what uh, Alice sends to, to Bob. He then does a timestamp plus one and sends that back to, to Alice and in this way we can actually uh, verify the, the keys that are, that are passed. Okay, so this is how a Kerberos infrastructure uh, is, is created. Any breach of the keys, uh, we can make sure that we refresh them for the long-term keys. But we need to make sure that the infrastructure in here is highly secure. If we want, we can log each of the keys that are created and each of the identities which actually created them. 
So if we needed to go back and actually find a key and also decrypt the message, then we will have a copy of it here. But perhaps what we do is that we make sure that the keys never exist ever again. OK, so that's been an outline of key distribution centres and also for Kerberos. Thank you.